are listening to the Paranormal Chronicles radio show. Here is your host, paranormal researcher and author of the best-selling A Most Haunted House, Gavin Lee Davis. Welcome, my name is JL Davis, author of the best-selling true account that is haunted horror of Haverford West and founder of ParanormalChronicles.com. Thank you for joining us on our pursuit of exploring all things paranormal, strange and mysterious. Tonight is a UFO special. Can I please thank you all for our phenomenal growth. We have had tens of thousands of listeners, thousands of downloads and so much feedback. Thank you so much. And if you're new to the series, then please press follow as you'll be part of something really special at the beginning of its journey. Plus, every month we give books away to our followers in our prize draw. Sincerely, thank you so much. I can't believe how quickly we have grown. We are one of the fastest growing paranormal podcasts out there and we do this for you. We love giving you free things too, so at the end of tonight's show, listen to how you can get your free digital paranormal magazine. No sign-ups, no nonsense, just a no-strings-attached magazine for you. This series is brought to you by our series sponsor, sixth-books.com. Visit sixth-books.com to delve into a world of mystery, the spiritual, the unknown, and the paranormal. Visit sixth-books.com today. If you have a story, experience or theory you would like to share, then message us on Facebook or Instagram at The Paranormal Chronicles, on Twitter at Paracron or email us at paranormalchronicles at aol.com. We have had so many people contact us with their encounters and yes, we will record them all and upload as soon as we can to keep them coming on tonight's show. What did one man see in the woods that changed his life forever? Is there a deeper meaning to the UFO phenomena? Are there deeper meanings in crop circles, shamanism and abduction cases? This episode will change the way you think about UFOs forever. David J. Moore joins us to discuss his new book, Evolutionary Metaphors, and his work unraveling the UFO enigma. This is a must listen for all UFO enthusiasts and for those who have had their own close encounters. David J. Moore is from Wordsley West Midlands. He studied English Literary Studies at the University of Worcester and lectured at both the first and second international Colin Wilson conferences. His work has been published by Cambridge Scholars and he regularly blogs at www.ritualinthedark.wordpress.com. Evolutionary Metaphors is his first book, but get used to hearing his name as his work is groundbreaking. Your world is about to change. On with the show. Our listeners love personal encounters, David. And in your book, you mention your own UFO encounter. Can we please start with that? That's no problem. In fact, the genesis of the book really comes out of that experience. And in that experience, I had um, eight years ago, in over eight years ago, in 2008, in February. And at the time, I was 22 or coming to around 23 years old. And um, I was reading a lot of um, existential works in philosophy, such as, you know, um, Fran- Franz Kafka, of the trial and Jean-Paul Sartre and nausea because it was quite fashionable especially when you first start reading you want to read the classics and so on so I sort of happened to have fallen into this gloomy literature and I was I picked up Colin Wilson's The Outsider which is his 1956 book on existentialism so I was reading this and often we would go up the woodland at night um, quite late at night we would take a few beers with my friends uh, usually on a weekends because Kingsford's quite a small village so that sometimes we just wanted a fire and I should add that my friends were in a metal band, which was called Dark Forest. So so there was this kind of folk interest they had, and they always sort of romanticised the, the woodland. So we used to go up there, and we'd start a little fire and drink some beers. And uh, we, we never took many beers, so we weren't drunk. Went through up there, and around about, I think it was February the 10th, 2008, I sat down on a fallen tree, which had sort of cleared part of the forest, so you could see into the horizon just over a village called Kimver. And in the distance, a little white light appeared and I looked at it and I, I thought it was a plane or a low a low flying plane and you know when you get the planes turning towards you it seems like there's a torch sort of directly facing you and you yes. think that's coming towards you and then it turns and it starts flashing and then you realize that it's a plane or something like that but this didn't it was just a white light coming towards us and we were watching it 
And it, we couldn't hear anything at all. It was completely silent. And it was hard to judge how far it was away because you would just see this white light and it was dark. It sort of dawned on me that it wasn't that far away at all and we should be hearing something. So we all sort of ran around the campfire and, and watched it. And it just kept on coming towards us quite slowly and in absolute silence. We didn't know what to say, you know, you just sort of sat there. And then eventually it came quite close to us and went carefully and quite slowly above the, the canopy, above the uh, glade area. And it was really colourful and completely silent couldn't quite make out the shape of it because the light was sort of overwhelming its structure and it went quite red quite red uh, almost entirely red slowly went and then went over to towards uh, Dudley and uh, just started to go across the horizon and then vanished I reacted sort of in a flight or fight mode ran away sort of was quite terrified of it I didn't know what to do because there was no expectation of what it was what it could do you were alone in a forest at night in, in the middle of the, the Midlands there's no context and we were all excited about it we were talking really energized by it because it was a complete mystery and then when i went home i um started typing up an email to the birmingham ufo group to report it and after that i decided i wanted to read books on ufos and i knew colin wilson had written one in his later part of his career in 1998 and that made perfect sense because i thought if he was writing about the subject i was interested in such as philosophy and existentialism and literature and then later on wrote a book about ufos i was really interested in how he'd bridge this these two seemingly opposite things so when i read that it sort of clumped together a whole new vision of the world that made me much more optimistic and it, it really changed my uh, taste from then on that's a wonderful way to perceive a ufo encounter because normally at least people baffled or mystified or frightened so just before we talk about colin when you reported ufo to the birmingham ufo group had there been other sightings there wasn't any other sightings that i know of but there were in the area there was a common sighting called the Dudley Dorito, which is a, a triangular <laughs> object with three lights on it, which is commonly reported in the Express and Star. Very common sighting, you know, all across the world, Belgium and America. It's one of the more prolific UFO yeah. shapes. Yeah, there's this triangular UFO, which is quite commonly. I'm not sure if it was the same thing, but in general, if you type in into Google sort of Kingsford UFO or, or the West Midlands UFO or Wolverhampton UFO, the sightings are quite prominent around there. You know, you'd read them in the newspaper with a sort of you know, scepticism usually you would just think it was a mis mis misidentified craft but when you see one yourself you know that many of these reports are probably true more true than you couldn't give them credit for of course there's going to be misidentifications i think one of the things i noticed as well after i'd seen this ufo which was clearly a anomalous craft of some sort um i started to look to the skies more and more often because i was always prepared to see another one after after it. and of course i would find myself misidentifying things quite easily just simply because i was so active looking at the sky and i'd be what's that you know sort of excited to see something again and i and i would see uh you know the chinese lanterns and, and things like that but yeah i think the ufo phenomena opens up when you see one and then, of course, there's the problem of believability. You want to tell people that they haven't got a reason to believe you unless they trust you as a person. Communicating it was the big part for me. And that took me a long time to get beyond that barrier and start to write down my thoughts on the experience, which lingered with me. Because when you have such an anomalous experience as that, it makes you question a lot of things about the world. Because if it's not accepted by the consensus a mainstream you feel a bit of an outsider you, people are sneering at the ufo and you, you feel well you know there's something real here but what is it there's no answer forthcoming if you've seen one you're no better off in some ways because you haven't got an answer for it either you can only say that it was a real phenomenon that you'd observed I have probably spoken to just as many sceptics as I have people who have had personal encounters like yourself. You go in almost apologetic as if you've got two heads or you've got something horrifically wrong with you. You kind of prepare a defence. But more often than not, what I find is, is that I speak to someone who's sceptical and then sooner or later it comes out, well, I don't believe in ghosts, but there was this one time I woke up in the night and my gran had passed away the day before, but I saw her at the end of the bed. Or I don't believe in it, but my dad's house was haunted. And there's always, I think, for whatever reason, well, I know the reason, and that is the media and the powers that be don't want us believing and having free thought about these things because these things distract us from the fact that we need to go to work and earn money and pay the bills and wonder who's going to win X Factor. Yes. <laughs> when that moment you saw that object in the sky, everything you knew up until that point 
changed. Yes, and that's why I called the book Evolutionary Metaphors, because it seemed to capture the experience in the best way possible, because it seemed a symbol of greater things, of more interesting things about existence, mysteries. And I was interested in the idea of mysteries being positive, so you could look at a, a, a metaphor, a symbol, and use it to grow yourself, but not necessarily to delude yourself. And, and go off into fantasy, but to enrich your sense of reality and possibility. And I think that's why Collins' work really converged with my own thinking, because I could see that he was looking and exploring a way out of the pessimism of that philosophy had jumped into, and he had developed a optimistic philosophy. And through doing that, he then went into UFOs and, and the occult and all sorts of odd phenomena, which once he was quite sceptical about as well when he first started researching it, thinking it would just be a, a collection of funny facts and things that fundamentally don't matter, sort of trivial things. But then he started reading into it and it, started to, it began to open up his perspective of what the human mind is capable of and what cultural anomalies uh, may shape our, our perception on, on reality on all levels, from space and time and so on. And one of the most important facts as I go into the book and towards the end of the book is uh, synchronicity phenomena. And I had noted when I was doing my research that curious coincidences or synchronicities would happen uh, when you either research searching or you got involved with the UFO phenomena. Arthur Kosler called it a uh, library angel. If you were doing research, books would just fall into your lap, essentially, when you're doing the research, which would guide you through the writing of it. It did feel like that when I wrote Evolutionary Metaphors, because um, the more I read into it, the more they seemed to cluster around you and in your life. And one of my favourite examples of this is uh, I was walking down the street in Starbridge Town, and I, w I was talking to someone, a friend at the time, and I was talking about a really strange subject anthroposophy which is uh, Rudolf Steiner who has a school a schools the Steiner schools and I, I never knew anything about anthroposophy so I said aloud I said what's what are the fruits of anthroposophy basically I just asked the question what are the benefits of anthroposophy but I used the term what are the fruits of anthroposophy which is an odd thing to ask anyway yeah, most definitely I've, I've never asked that before it's a bizarre question and I, I walked into a charity shop which had a collection of about you know a maximum of 30 books underneath some clothes in a very small collection of books and was sticking out is the book called The Fruits of Anthroposophy, a collection of le lectures by Rudolf Steiner. Good and I was so brief. I was so blown away by it because it didn't make any sense causally, or you couldn't say. I, I either knew it was there prior to I was looking into the future unconsciously when I was talking about it, or it could have been a coincidence. But it's these kinds of things which make you question the underlying nature of reality, what constitutes your life and how time and space and meaning converge in odd moments and make you question reality. And um, the UFO phenomenon is full of this, and especially with a recent book I read um, called American Cosmic by Dr. Pasolka, which is on Oxford University Press, so it's, it's quite an esteemed publishers. Yes. And she talks about um, synchronicity being related to the highest echelons of society, such as biotech technology, NASA experts, and so on. And she said that some of these technologies that they create are sometimes guided by synchronicities and happenstance events, which are quite miraculous. This ties up with the UFO phenomena, and this complements my own work in evolutionary metaphors, which was quite exciting to see it confirmed in so recently in a, an Oxford University Press book. Now, your book is called Evolutionary Metaphors, and it seems that the UFO and its related phenomenon, such as abductions and crop circles, abide by another set of laws, even logic. Many others explore these themes, and how do you tie all of this together in your own work? Evolutionary metaphors, a catch-all phrase, which I, I, call, I call it it's sort of a general philosophical bracket which you can fit these phenomena into. And the crop circle is a good good one to begin with because that the history of that starts quite obscurely I think around 70s I think it traces back further than that but it was definitely in the late 70s when it became more well known and it started off fairly simply and with no apparent reason and farmers were obviously angry that their crops had been flattened but often they'd find that the crop itself wasn't actually snapped it was bent down as if it was pushed down with a hot iron of some sort and then the, the crop circles became more and more advanced so it was just beyond exp explanation there was no apparent motive for it other than say uh, say if there were people out there wanting to create art in the fields but no not putting any claim to it. it seemed like a lot of effort to go to and then not have any credit drawn to your name and then of course there was all the the fakes with the uh, the the famous case of i think it's david and someone else who 
forgot the other guy's name, but they claimed that they had done it. And obviously, they couldn't have done all of them because they spread around Japan, Canada, all around the world, North North America. Ice so circles on. in Siberia. Ice circles, yes. It extends everywhere. Yeah. And there seemed to be some kind of trickster-like element to that phenomena, which ties very well with every other dimension of the UFO that doesn't quite make sense. And it seems to be a deliberate pushing of our, our explanations, mystery. It just presents itself as a mystery, an impenetrable uh, mystery. And I think it, even in looking into, again, if you look into the crop, crop circle phenomena, even passively, say if you were a farmer and it happened to you and you picked up a book on crop circles and you knew it was a reality that these things were unexplainable, you would soon be led down a rabbit hole of different explanations for quantum physics, spirituality, deep symbolism of, of the occult, and you'd be led into this strange dimension of thinking. And I think that's one of the, the crucial messages, if there is a message at the heart of all of it. It's um, a deliberate pushing or stretching of our contextual limits to force us to ask very different questions about where we live. If it shapes a more positive vision, I think that's what, what we have to do on our behalf. Say, if we're embracing this mystery, we need to make it enriching for ourselves. Otherwise, it, we'd be led into um, spiralling fantasy and delusion. But if you can find a groundwork for it, and which I found in Wilson's work, but it can be found all the way through every other book on UFOs as well. If you can sort of get past this, you start to live a much more enriched life. It becomes a lot more interesting because there's a mystery, which is taken away from the materialistic view of the world because you have to accept life as it is. But, although that sounds very negative to say as it is because it's so wonderful anyway that we exist at all. But there's this context which makes life even more robust. And I think there's this motive as well that draws you outwards and towards things. And then you have a sense of time, long distances of time and the point of human evolution and the, the directions of science. And there isn't this um, accepting that we have the tools necessary now to explain the limits. There's something always around the corner. And I think that's what's the evolutionary dynamic of the phenomena. I love that so much because I say constantly there is not a, a human being alive and knows all the intricacies of the human mind, the universe, space and time. And the fact that life is a mystery, that it is more than what we are just told it is, makes it a very exciting place to be. And when we do discover something new, it just opens more doors. And you were saying about crop circles. One of my favourite ever pieces of research to do with a crop circle phenomenon was this gentleman. He worked out that they were musical notes. Oh, yes. Uh, Gerard Hawkes, I think. I believe that's correct. Yeah. And he was saying that it possibly that it it was a way to communicate. They were leaving us little bits of information to decipher this code, and we had to work out in what order they went into. And I remember hearing a recording of this gentleman. He's playing on like a synthesizer or something like that. And it gave me goosebumps because it was that moment of what if this is right? What if there is something or someone out there leaving us little clues? And once we've put them all together, they'll give us another clue or reveal an answer. And that's an exciting place to live in. Definitely. And um, the, one of the things I went into into the later chapter was shamanism as well, which is sometimes brought up in ufology. But shamans, they interact with other entities and so on, and they all go into hallucinogenic trances, uh, have visions of luminescent snakes in the uh, South African basin. And they, they'll communicate telepathically and have messages. And sometimes they meet extraterrestrial entities, very similar to the ones reported by abductees. Well, often they're abductees themselves. And that led to a certain answer as well to the, the UFO phenomenon. And I use the example of Credo Mutwa, who is a Zulu shaman, one of the depositories of the knowledge of the whole tribe of, of the Zulu people. And he was taught completely orally. So he's one of a very old tradition. And he's in his 90s now. He claims that he had um, extraterrestrial visitors. And they're often severely traumatic experiences, which he, he describes in detail sometimes. But they always led to an inner an awakening in himself, which he had accept uh, larger dimensions of reality into his own life. And it crosses over into the dead as well, and into the, to the afterlife. You start to see a thread, all of the cultures throughout history, that sort of converge on this, um, on this notion of deeper realities, signs and portents and synchronicities and the miraculous healings and so on, which makes it a very exciting thing to get involved with. That mythology continues in the present day 
The work of fiction, such as books and movies, has been instrumental in spreading the UFO mythology, which you explore in your book. What are some of the key works that give an insight into the reality of the phenomenon? And what is this strange line between reality and fiction? I think in fiction you can read the underlying mythology of what's going on, and you can get a sort of a temperature gauge of what people are thinking about and how and our very limits of our questions. And I think they have a lot of freedom as well in creativity. So when you're writing a non-fiction book like me, you're very bound to uh, fact and, and, and turning towards case studies and so on. But with a work of fiction, you can go anywhere you like. And that's, that's what, something I explored because I felt that was a valuable contribution to ufology is for people to simply wonder and to sketch out fantasy realities which might answer the phenomena but without being restricted to being a work of fact that you didn't have to announce it as fact and i think that's quite a healthy attitude to have towards the paranormal in general there's there's two key works i think and one was film quite recently called arrival it's called Arrival. Yes, marvellous movie. And it's an ex- excellent film. And what really struck me about that was the way the aliens communicate to the human beings through a sort of bizarre ink blob. It's, it's a circle with uh, lots of offshoots coming out of the circle, like a sort of splat. And uh, this, they look like ink blobs, chaotic, meaningless at first. And the scientists in the film look at it. And then they realise it's a code, very, very complex, fractal-like language. And it, and it frustrates time and space that we ordinarily understand. And they seem to talk backwards and forwards through time about people's lives. And they get sort of integrated with a, a very odd dimension when they're re- researching the extraterrestrial in the film. I won't ruin the whole film. That's just one of the basics of it. But I thought that was a great one because that reminded me very much of the work of Carl Jung, the psychologist, and, uh, the Swiss psychologist yes. who came up. And he uh, used to paint these symbols called mandalas, which were circles, and they have very rich patterns. And he used to claim that these circles were the symbols of the integration of the psyche and they communicated in a very odd way. So you could sort of meditate on a, a mandala, and it would have these deep ripples into the psyche, which could bring up surface levels of reality. And he used to go into states of what he called active imagination, where he'd drop down into his dream worlds and have, have very deep symbols about the future. Uh, he had a famous dream about the coming of the war, and he sank down deep into this rocky underbed with this pool of water running through and a strange corpse floating through the water. It's all very surreal. But I couldn't help but make the connection with the mandala symbol of Carl Jung's work and the, the way this alien communicates. And in, of course, in Arrival, yes. And in Arrival. And, and he used to say that the UFO, uh, he wrote a book later in his career, one of his last, last books in 1958, uh, called Flying Saucers and Myths of Seen in Our, in Our Skies. And he says that the UFO is a symbol of wholeness, and he saw it very much through the psychoanalytic lens and saw it as a an evolutionary symbol that uh, unifies us. And that sort of language and the way the alien communicates in Arrival really brought this together for me. And similarly, uh, by Christopher Nolan, Interstellar, where the alien talks through gravity and moving things and changing time on the watch and that that's very much like a synchronicity works because there's another dimension that seems to be outside of us which can align these events in our life such as my example with the the book where i mentioned fruits of anthroposophy and then 10 minutes later i see it the same book in a shop it seems like some arrangement outside of ordinary space and time made this symbolic um, happening occur and this kind of language of the aliens is very important and that brings me on to a novel, which is Miracle Visitors by Ian Watson, which was re- written in 1978. And he brilliantly, he explored the UFO phenomena to extreme degree, I think. I don't think anyone has really come up with as many ideas in one novel. And he sees it as a, a sort of level of logic which has to come down into our world. And it communicates with us through, through symbols, synchronicities. And he calls it a certain suction. Like a, there's like a hoover at the end of time and it pulls human history towards this shape, which I really like. Uh, he said that the other thing was um, because they have to talk into our logical terms, there's a certain loss in the communication. And sometimes it can come out damaging and quite traumatic. But in other times, they, he, he mentions in a sentence which condenses uh, ufology very well for me, that a will to create mystery and not damage. And uh, that really sums, sums up the uh, research into ufology when you're reading about um abduction cases where there's a certain sense of trauma there's a following transformation after it which integrates the psyche as Jung would say 
We will be right back after these important messages. Hi there, my name is Claire Waters and I would like to invite you on an incredible journey. I have written a book based on my personal experiences called Raising Faith, a true story of raising a child psychic medium. It's my family's extraordinary experiences with our young daughter's ability to communicate with spirits and the inspirational lessons learned on our journey. Raising Faith is currently available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle and wherever books are sold. Join me on this beautiful and incredible adventure. For more information on Raising Faith, visit my website, raisingfaith.co.uk, or my Facebook page, Raising Faith Book. See you there. Sixth Books will take you to other worlds, haunt you, open your mind, and push you far beyond the veil of the unknown. Sixth Books is a leading publisher of books on the body, mind, and spirit, the paranormal, consciousness, ancient wisdom, and the afterlife. Explore today, learn today, open your mind today, read today. Visit sixth-books.com today. The world as you know it is about to change. Do you wish for more paranormal and spiritual content? The Paranormal Chronicles magazine is a free digital magazine crammed with the very best in paranormal and spiritual articles and features. No sign-up, no subscription, just free reading and knowledge for you. Read today at www.theparanormalchronicles.com forward slash magazine. The International Chart Topping. Haunted Horror of Haverford West has been described as... Terrifyingly real, a must read. Shocking and chilling brilliance. Genuinely worrying, utterly frightening. Don't read before bed. Described as one of the spookiest writers out there, best selling author G.L. Davies presents Haunted Horror of Haverford West, the true paranormal account that is shocking the world. Dare you enter? Dare you read? Haunted. Horror of Haverford West is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, and wherever books are sold. Pray you never have to live there. Because there's two very distinct abduction experiences. You have the Billy Meyer style experience where he's given knowledge, he's given round trips around the universe and back in time, and it's a very exciting experience. And then you have the horrific ones, the Travis... Walton was it Travis Walton yeah. case of fire in the sky which was horrendous and my <laughs> my latest research uh, which will be in my new book next year is about alien abductions and I've spent a long long time investigating haunted houses and the psychological damage that can do but the alien abductions have actually terrified me <laughs> yeah they um, when when I read them they're very creepy some of them and uh, they have an insectoid truly alien nature and they creep into your bedrooms at night and take you away and you're completely paralyzed and taken into an apparently m medical room and, and, and examined. You know, these are the common tropes that you find in the research of uh, Bud Hopkins, invaders, and uh, and they're very traumatic. And, and Whitley Strieber's is one of my favorite works. Communion. Communion is one of the most prolifically motivating book for me that has got me into the subject. It's absolutely stunning. When I I remember when I was first reading UFO literature and I am. Um, I was looking at communion it, and for some, because it was so famous, it seemed too obvious to read. So I always delayed it, thinking it was going to be a, a fairly conventional story about alien greys that I'd read in other books. But when I actually got around to reading communion, I realised it's nothing like you expect. It is true. It's a truly s surrealistic and spiritual and terrifying. It's a magical book. I mean, it's it's truly one of the most archetypal ripples in our culture, which is the the common alien grey face that we see all the time in masks and t-shirts and 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 so on. Is it really comes from that cover of that book, and and that book alone is a groundbreaking book. I mean, I've read it a couple of times now. And I've never gotten to the bottom of it. It's it's truly mysterious to me. Yeah, I think um, he brings a lot of it together as well. He he focuses on the psychological and spiritual aspects. And he often calls the UFO abduction experience that he undergoes as a sort of test. And as he's gotten older, since his initial abductions, he seems to have gone more on a more positive relationship with them. And his last book um, was called The Afterlife Revolution. 
and and that sort of bridges everything together for me. I'm going to have to introduce you to Whitley because I think you two are going to have a marvelous conversation. I listen to his podcast and keep up with his blog as often as I can. And when Anne sadly died, he was very much convinced that she was speaking to him from the afterlife. Yeah. And said that Earth was just one of a multitude of soul factories for mm. a greater purpose. That gave Whitley a lot of comfort after her passing because you could tell he missed her dearly. You know, she'd helped him unravel so much of this information he was presented over his life. Which brings me on a wonderful segue. is that you discuss American science fiction author Philip K. Dick. Yes. Now, he's one of my favourite authors of all time, after Kurt Vonnegut. And I believe it was his book, Valis. There was yeah. a bit on page 44 that said, if you don't understand this now, stop reading. And I don't think I've ever got past page 44 of Valis. I've got through all his sci-fi <laughs> stuff, but Valis kind of broke me. Maybe I'll revisit it. But you discuss Philip K. Dick at length and what was it about him that became such an important key to your research well philip k dick's always been my, one of my favorite writers as well and i started reading i think it was one of the earliest books i ever read i only really started reading around about 17 because i it was from a working class family so i never really read any books but it was philip k dick that threw open the doors of perception for me and it was with ubic where there's a sort of a rocket crash and everyone goes into another dimension and they're communicated with a, a miraculous advertisement of a spray can which enables them to fight off the decay of the universe and I always liked that symbolically and then I started to get quite obsessed with Philip K. Dick's work and I used to go on the Philip K. Dick website and scan through the bibliography and see which book I would read next and if I had a favourite book I'd read around that period because I always felt he was very fertile around uh, 1967 but then I worked my way up to his later works such as uh, the Vallis trilogy and I, I started to read Vallis and it was the first book I'd, I'd read out of all the books I'd been reading where completely went over my head the first time around I, di I didn't know anything about the philosophy he was discussing such as Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Neoplatonism all at the back of the book with the exegesis his 8,000 page collection of his, his thoughts on religion and his uh, pink light experience with an extraterrestrial which beamed paintings of Kandinsky into his, his third eye, you know, all of this very heady stuff. And I didn't dismiss him when I first read it. I didn't dismiss it as madness or anything like that because I felt he had so, he clearly had such a fertile imagination because all of the films of the Hollywood films that have been adapted on these books since suggest that he was a, a true genius who would have been very rich if had he had he survived after the 80s. But when I came to Vallis, I knew I had to get a grip on that book because it felt like it was communicating a lot, but I couldn't quite comprehend it when I was younger. But over the years, uh, I started to read more of the esoteric literature and occult, such as uh, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, and so on. And I started to realise that his speculations were well ahead of time, as he's novels are and he had been engaged with holographic universe theories alien alien speculations on what these beings might be alternative timelines such as the roman history living simultaneously with our present time and this was one of his um, his beliefs that he was the reincarnation of someone from uh, the christian era so he had these completely blending realities but i always admired how he able to distance himself and not take him too seriously and he used fiction as a vehicle to explore these ideas in an ironic and detached way but he was still taking them very seriously later in his life but one of the things i liked about his work which tied in with the theory in evolutionary metaphors is is a term zebra which is a vision of reality that the universe disguises itself as god basically and that god disguises himself as the universe so what we see we can't see god because he is the environment so he called it zebra and he said when do you know that the universe is occupied by god it's rather like he said that the universe was worn like a series of clothes so one day one day god puts on his outfit and he's wearing the universe like a guy's i always like this it's a very crazy concept but i think it tied in very well with them um, something called the transcendental ego which was explored in the uh, philosophy of uh, phenomenology and it's what is behind our perception of reality and i've always thought when you feel very alert and awake the reality seems to vibrate with more meaning you look out more and more at the world and it seems to be more animated and colin wilson always argued that behind the perception there was this subliminal self he called the trans personal ego which is deeper still it goes into the deep unconscious of uh, what Carl Jung called the um, collective unconscious and I always thought if this is brought up it would seem like the world was occupied by what Philip K. Dick called zebra and it would be this sort of mystical awakening this is what 
Philip K. Dick seems to explore and his um, vision of a reality very deep. I think in some ways that Valis, his uh, vast active intelligence system, is a sort of science fictional rendering of Jung's collective unconscious. And I think that's the way Philip K. Dick saw things. He wrote about this mystical dimension of life using science fiction metaphors. And I think that really points to what my thesis evolutionary metaphors. And uh, this is why Philip K. Dick's really at the core of the book. Because at the end of his life, he was bedridden heavily medicated you know he'd gone from science fiction into theology and philosophy mm. and it makes you wonder what individuals are tapping into what is the source yeah you know that separates say a philip k dick from someone else you know are mm. we all capable of having these ideas and images in our mind to communicate to the rest of us i think there's a stepping down process uh, not not in a, a patronizing way what i mean is uh, you know when you need to put a plug into a wall socket and you need to step down the electricity to use in in a say a u.s plug socket or U European plug socket. I think this kind of fiction work is a way of stepping down the visions in, into something comprehensible. And I think the dangers of that, which can lead to dissolution of the and disintegration of the mind, is, is a threat. And I think this is the problem of trickster phenomena as well. One thing I always liked, there was a warning against being misled or fairy led, or is usually the term, was by the writer who was a friend of Philip K. Dick's, I think, called Robert Anton Wilson, who wrote Cosmic Trigger and the Illuminatus Trilogy. And he threw together every conspiracy theory he could find in a novel. And he was making fun. He wasn't making fun of people who believe in conspiracy theories. He was making fun of how much fun you can have with putting everything together and living in a permanently paranoid state. But he could laugh at it. And that was quite important because he knew to be agnostic. He knew when to step back and say, you know, let's not get carried away with these ideas, but let's not dismiss them either. And and that's kind of the healthy approach which I, I employ through my own book. I love uh, far out ideas as much as many people do, but I always want to bring them into a into a useful shape or form. And that's why I call it evolutionary uh, metaphors, because I, I like the idea of something being symbolic, but very positive and which integrates towards a deeper understanding of yourself and the world around you. And hopefully that just for the sake of enjoyment as well. I wrote the book out of a great deal of fun. It's an excellent book as well, and I truly, truly mean that. Now, you're saying about this trickster-like phenomenon. How do we protect ourselves from that? This is one of the things I've been interested in more recently. I explore it at the end of Evolutionary Metaphors. I basically call for a a vigilance over your your own psyche and your own emotions i think in the modern world with politics and so on being very heated if you go on twitter you'll find your emotions and anger just rises as soon as you look at the speed and there's some <laughs> politics and it's it's that, that's a sort of trickster thing i think even if you could use twitter as a trickster symbol that would be funny because it is it, it crosses this boundary and the irony of it, you can't explain yourself in any length. You're limited to a very small amount of characters to describe yourself. So there's no chance of you actually having a constructive debate on that. I think that the thing you can take away in a positive sense from such a trickery piece of, of the Internet is to know that you are uh, you are responding to it and then control that. And I think that's one of the joys of uh, meditation. I don't really practice it very often myself, but I remember through the course of my uh, one of my jobs is to very closely focus on politics and one day I was I, I realized my mind was buzzing with contradictory opinions different things I had read it gave me a bit of a headache so I thought well I'm gonna sit down and try to meditate and I found it really did calm my thoughts down I could control myself a bit better so if I went on the internet I would catch my my adrenaline that was gonna rush I could catch it and that's part of dealing with the trickster, because if you bring the trickster back into yourself, you can see that something just outside of your perception. You can only really detect it by your very subtle qualities of changes in your emotions and, and your body. And with phenomenological vi vigilance, as it would be called, phenomenology just means the, the study of, of your perceptions as if they're almost alien to yourself. So you have this uh, ability to self-reference without being caught up in your uh, perceptual maze. But I think this is quite an important part. If you were to bypass the trickster, you have to be very vigilant about yourself and you have to step back and not be pulled into destructive associative thinking. As much as I admire conspiracy theory, 
for example, for questioning mainstream, which I think is a brilliant thing and should be done. I think one of its drawbacks can be for an individual who's not ready, he can be drawn into a very negative view of the world and lose precisely the powers that would be most useful for challenging the system in the first place. And that is motivation, health, clarity of thought, articulation, self-discipline, you know, all of these qualities. And these are the qualities you have to um, you have to create with a degree of pressure even through hardship discipline you know this these are the things i i I try to do myself it provides me with uh, clarity and much more optimism than drifting in a gloomy uh, half twilight world of too much conspiracy thinking and how does ufo phenomenon make you think differently i think it's the furthest reach and it's so clearly two things it makes you question consensus reality for a start and it makes you question the mainstream media how things are being presented to you and on another level it makes you question scientific paradigms scientific you know, consensus reality time space meaning a life after to death it really stretches your imagination and it gives you a lot to think about it's like a breath of fresh air in some ways and um, when you read a lot of the books the, the usually the final chapters are trying to sum up what what you've just read you would have read of all these accounts and then it would be the final question is how do these make sense and usually there's the turn to the unusual world of magic the occult quantum physics and the power of the mind as well which is very important I think the power of the mind is the most important tool we have for understanding the UFO phenomena. And I, the, one of the things I really pull and push forward in my book is not to be afraid of intuition and dreams and taking hints and symbols of things. I, I take care to listen to dreams and things like this because it helps me creatively. Just what, the other day, someone, my friend who's read my book, Evolutionary Metaphors, said to me that he had a dream about the book. And he said someone or something said to him in the dream that evolutionary metaphors are one half of the story, but the other is connections between people. And I thought that was the most profound thing because it's connections between people, the most important thing in life. And if it's discussing ideas, uh, expanding each other's experience positively, this is the most important thing. And if synchronicities can be very uh, profound events and can make you question uh, the meaning of life and give you a very positive boost but i think the most profound synchronicities people can have is with each other that bridge way between the two is more more powerful than we can have and that's what we i think would bridge us and, and ground us with the security and intelligence that we need to face something so alien as the ufo it's the million dollar question that a lot of people are listening to the interview a lot of people are going to go out now and read evolutionary metaphors and i cannot recommend this book enough it is truly fantastic and if you are interested in some of the things we've been talking about tonight arrival interstellar two of the best films you'll ever see philip k dick things of that nature there's one question the ufo phenomenon is it what we think it is is it that it is alien beings or is it something different again i think um in the past few days there's been a lot of reports of the navy u.s navy seeing the U uh, ufo phenomena and it's frustrated their instruments that it can fly to thirty thousand feet apparently hypersonic speeds and then stop and our instruments and our governments seem to be no le none the wiser but i think it's essential nature is is the question and the second chapter or the first chapter of my book is called the power of the question and i think the power of the question is by looking at it and maintaining it and and if you maintain this question you'll find that it expands and it expands on every other dimension of life as well it will be a powerful symbol of, of other realities and i think if you're talking about the reality of it the washington post recently published an opinion piece called ufos are real we now only have to accept this to be true so in the in the past week ironically it's been lucky for me in writing a ufo book and having this week being due out on friday that the all of the new, main, mainstream news outlets are basically pushing for they're basically saying it's a certain phenomenon but no one knows what it is <laughs> i think like we want it to be aliens don't want to be alone in the universe because it's a huge yeah. vast place and to be alone it's quite frightening because mm. we're not doing a very good job on the planet and it would be nice to go and ask a neighbor for some tools or some help or some yes. advice <laughs> on on what to do next and to think that we may end whether it's an asteroid a virus war whatever and then that's it you know there is the argument we are the cosmic seed and we are alone and we will strive and advance across the solar system and then the galaxy the wonderful possibility is that we are not alone i grew up watching star trek and babylon 5 and all these great sci-fi you know reading philip k dick 
and it's just exciting to think that there is so much more we would be of interest because we are literally on the cusp of either doing something incredible and evolve into the next stage or we're on the cusp of destroying ourselves and i yes. think we have great interest to any race out there as a lesson as an experiment whatever the case is and i'd like there to be aliens I don't want them to abduct me and do some of the stuff they've done to other people. <laughs> I'd rather the Billy Meyer experience, you know, where I get taken back in time and I go and see some dinosaurs and go and see the planet. That would be great and given loads of knowledge and I can write into books. So what are the larger implications for our culture? And will the UFO return in a new disguise or form? I think in the past week, it seems to return into the mainstream discussion. And it has arrived at a pinnacle point in uh, political history where the green movement's rising and there's a divisions going through Europe and the US is a controversial things going on all the time. And it would be nice to think that there was some sort of intervention. I can't help but see it as a symbolic phenomena uh, as well. I mean, it happens in an objective form that it can be tracked by radar and, and US uh, military. And I don't doubt its objective existence. But what, it's, what is it doing is the question i mean why is it flying around and frustrating the instruments what's the purpose it, there, there should be I, I should imagine that there is a purpose to that and even if it's getting into mainstream discussion what kind of um, effect does that have on the public consciousness and i think in in moments of crisis is always when the biggest change comes in life as in society as well so if there is to be major changes around the corner and with these uh, apparently a paranormal or occult phenomena of the ufo coming in right at this crucial moment who knows where it could lead us and who knows what kind of discussions we'll be having in 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 a few years from now i would love to put on the news in like two years and there you are david talking <laughs> about your research not on a kind of i told you so but saying it's always been here it has the angels of biblical times the fairies a lot of the aspects of our myths and our history our legends they've probably always been here yes and after thousands of years of this existing human civilization because i do believe that we may have been here a lot longer yeah that we still can't just accept it and that for everyone who's listening to the show right they're gonna love it they're gonna have opinions they're gonna have ideas but people if we just play this on the bbc you know just to a general audience people be saying well what's that man doing wasting his time <laughs> But what are the skeptics so afraid of? That we must accept what we are told. Is that part of the control that our governments and our religions are placed upon us? Well, maybe we can just have an open mind and think, what if? And the fact that the news is talking about the United States Air Force have been tracking these UFOs. And then we had the Chilean UFO a couple of years ago. Yeah. The, the flap of UFOs in the Gulf Stream. We had them in Belgium. We talked earlier on about the triangular Dorito-shaped craft. We've had flying saucers. There's so much evidence. And they can't all just be military aircraft and drones and you know misidentified objects there is something having a huge interest in us to the extent i believe they might have had a huge part in our existence from day one and it's also informed our culture as well all of our favorite films include some kind of aliens interstellar star wars star wars uh, x files it's always been there even if it's in fairy folklore there's always some other interdimensional being or some spiritual entities they seem to almost disguise themselves for the modern age evolutionary metaphors is a must read for everyone with an interest or experience with this phenomenon the book is out made 31st it's available on amazon barnes and noble kindle wherever books are sold and it is a truly fantastic read i'm not just saying that you just listen to david for for the amount of time we've been on this interview and that is literally touching the tip of a huge incredibly interesting iceberg and as david said we are on the cusp of something life-changing so get reading the book now and be prepared get the answers before everyone else it's amazing now i employ everyone out there with an interest to pick it up this will be your go-to book to learn and understand more about ufos now that said what's next for you david i'm working on a sort of sequel to the book um i've not got much far into it but it's called convergence of worlds and i want to bring together the psychological and the occult into a much deeper exploration everyone start with evolutionary metaphors it is a must read now where can people contact you for more information to keep up to date with your projects and your work how can i keep in touch with you david i run a blog called richelinthedark.wordpress.com and i upload um essays reflections book reviews and I, tr I try to keep everything on there i i usually pre-run a lot of 
my um, upcoming work on there as well. And do you have a Facebook page as well, Evolutionary Metaphors? Yes, I have Evolutionary Metaphors on a Facebook page and I've got a Twitter page as well. Which hopefully doesn't upset you too much. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. I've disciplined myself now. <laughs> I know meditation. I, yeah. I sit there meditating with a lot of vulgarity sometimes <laughs> at some of the things that comes across in my news feeds. Now, before we finish the interview, I just want to ask you a question. You've done the research. How would you feel if tonight you were walking outside and you saw that object again? How would it make you feel this time? It would be very mind blowing and it would uh, align with my research and, and the book coming out. So I'd be quite convinced it was coming f for me for a particular reason. And I hope not for any of the uh, dark sort of reasons that that you read in some of the abduction rich literature. But it would um, confirm me and I would hope I could positively um, take on board that experience. I think it would give me a deeper conviction, at least. I would sincerely hope that in our lifetime yes. <laughs> that the answers come to us. I think we're ready. Not everyone will accept it. A lot of people will be exceptionally challenged by this. I think they're slowly feeding it to us. And little by little, decade by decade, in the 90s, it really ran ramped up with things like the X-Files. We started getting images of triangular aircraft from Belgium and then we had the Belgium Air Force tracking an object. And every year, every decade, they're just feeding us a little bit more. And with this recent news this week about the Americans have been tracking stuff, I think the time's going to be very, very close. I think soon, sooner than we think. We've just been conditioned for, hey guys, we can't hide it anymore. We've got drones everywhere, we've got cameras everywhere. We've got independent space agencies up in space. We can't hide the truth anymore. And if these aliens or whatever's behind the enigma is up for it, I think it's a really nice time for them to say hello and maybe give us some advice on how to keep this planet going. Definitely. So there we have it, Evolutionary Metaphors by David J. Moore. It is a fantastic book. Get it wherever you can, from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, wherever books are sold. By the time this podcast is uploaded, go and read it. It will change your life life david thank you very much anything you'd like to add um i just hope people enjoy the book and open-mindedness is really what i push for there we have it david can be contacted at dmore629 at gmail.com join his facebook page evolutionary metaphors enjoy his blog at www.ritualinthedark.wordpress.com I think you will agree that his book, Evolutionary Metaphors, is an instant classic that will shape UFO research and thinking as we hopefully head into an era of UFO acceptance. Evolutionary Metaphors by David J. Moore is available wherever books are sold. Read it and let me know what you think. David will also contribute to the next issue of the Paranormal Chronicles free digital magazine. Yes, it's free. No sign up, no subscription, just a free digital magazine jam packed with hundreds of pages on all things paranormal and spiritual. Get yours at www.vparanormalchronicles.com forward slash magazine. That's www.vparanormalchronicles.com forward slash magazine. If you like all things paranormal, then you will love the magazine. There is more on the UFO subject in this series. Dave Dominguez talks about his incredible evidence to prove mankind is far older than we think, that we may have had access to incredible technologies and may have even been to the moon in episode two and in episode eight we have one man's chilling personal account of a terrifying ufo encounter go for our archive there's something for everyone from guest interviews like david tonight collections of recordings of paranormal witness accounts to on location documentaries investigating hauntings we truly want to offer you everything we can press follow for your chance to win a free book each month and our followers monthly draw if you have enjoyed the show then follow by following, not only will you never miss an upload, but every month one of our followers will be contacted as they will have won a free paranormal book. How cool is that? And that's just for listening and following. Let me leave you with this. A quote from Whitley Strieber's Communion, a book for David's own evolutionary metaphors will soon be joining as a must read on UFO topic. When you read this incredible story, do not be too skeptical. Somewhere in your own past, there may be some lost hour or strange recollection. That means that you also have had this experience. This book is about forming a new relationship with the unknown. Instead of shunning the darkness, we can face straight into it with an open mind. When we do that, the unknown changes. Fearful things become understandable and truth is suggested. The enigmatic presence of the human mind winks back from the dark. Sleep well. <laughs>